Okay. We are live to record. Perfect. Welcome back to another installment of In Conversation. I'm your host, kind of, with our David Pardo. Here to introduce the real host. Um, we'll just remind you before we turn over to Rabbi Schaffer that um, welcome your uh, questions and participation. Drop it in the chat box. Uh, if you're in the Zoom, if you're watching on YouTube, um, please text a friend of yours who is on the Zoom. Um, and also a reminder now that uh, we are not here next week. Um, the feeling was that Mose Chavez, Mose Forum was going to be a uh, a uh, hard night for, <laughs> for a lot of people. So, um, in the meantime, I'd like to introduce my chef, who is the Jewish congregation um, in Baltimore, Maryland. He's also the Mid Atlantic Regional Director for the Orthodox Union. Um, he's got a podcast on the spot. He does a lot of amazing things um, on social media, there's a lot of places to learn with him, learn from him. Um, and tonight we're going to chat with him. So turning it over, Rabbi Shaffer. Thank you, Rabbi Parda. You're making me blush. Um, it is so wonderful to be here with everyone. Uh, again, just to repeat uh, something Rabbi Pardo mentioned, um, both Lisa and I, I'm going to let Lisa do most of the talking, um, I hope. Um, both Lisa and I uh, would love to hear your reaction or your questions or your insights uh, through the chat feature. I'm going to be monitoring the chat feature. Um, and uh, if anything comes up in specific, any questions you want to pose to Lisa uh, in specific, please feel free to use the chat. Um, and if possible, where possible, we will uh, we will try and, uh, and incorporate uh, whatever insight or whatever questions or comments you have where possible. Um, I, I wanted to introduce my good friend, uh, Lisa Ferentz. Um, I have two experiences that I want to share um, uh, by, intru by introduction of you, Lisa. Um, number one, uh, Eliza, my wife and I um, have a custom, which we unfortunately couldn't uh, do this past Rosh Hashanah, uh, but we have a custom every Rosh Hashanah of inviting uh, Lisa and her husband, Dr. Kevin, uh, for a meal on Rosh Hashanah. We've done it. We've been in Baltimore now, I think four Rosh Hashanahs, and we've done it for three of them. Um, and uh, I, I've never shared with Lisa why. Uh, part of the reason why um, is because I always find myself, uh, two reasons. Number one, learning so much about myself, learning so much about uh, the human uh, condition by just speaking with Lisa and Kevin. Uh, Kevin, just for full disclosure, Kevin's my, my doctor uh, and Lisa is my, uh, my good friend, my inspiration. Um, so we always invite Lisa and Kevin on uh, Rosh Hashanah to come because um, I learn so much about humanity when I, when I talk with them. Uh, when we, we engage in discussion. Um, and also they're just great. They're just so optimistic and so full of life. And on Rosh Hashanah, that's what you want to feel. You want to feel, you want to be with people who are full of life, who are full of joy. Um, and uh, we always have a great time. That's number one. Number two, when I, uh, when I became the rabbi in this small little shul in, uh, in Baltimore, um, I didn't start until August, but in July, uh, they were running a, uh, Baltimore was running a program for, uh, for the rabbis of Baltimore. Um, to talk about um, abuse, I think, abuse in the community. Um, and uh, someone messaged me to say, a congregant is, is presenting, you should go. So I, I drove down um, and uh, it, was, it was a long drive. I, I was, it was pretty exhausting. Um, but from that moment, from the moment I, first moment I got to uh, hear Lisa's presentation, um, I, I knew this was someone who would change my thinking um, around uh, people and how to engage in people. So. Uh, by way of introduction, Lisa, if you could just, I guess, give a little bit of background, your story, um, your professional and personal life up until up until this very special moment. I have to catch my breath. I'm so moved by everything you said. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Lisa. And um, as far as Kevin and I are concerned, we have a lifetime pass for Rosh Hashanah meal. In Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm a clinical social worker and I've been in private practice for about 36 years now. And I specialize in working with adolescents and adult survivors of trauma. And that often means growing up in a family where there was physical abuse, sexual abuse, working with people who've experienced clergy abuse, growing up in a family with addiction, growing up with a parent who had undiagnosed, untreated depression or anxiety. 
Um, and with that comes a whole myriad of coping strategies uh, and, and manifestations that, that deserve a tremendous amount of, of support. So it's been my privilege to have that practice, as I say, for about 36 years. And about 14 years ago, I also started my own institute where we have a phenomenal faculty of other clinicians, and we basically provide continuing education to mental health providers. My passion, as the rabbi knows well, is, is trauma and a very strengths-based, depathologized, meaning I'm much more interested in what is right about my clients. I'm focus, I focus on their resiliency and their strengths, as opposed to wanting to give them 10 diagnoses and focusing on what's wrong with them. And so that's really my passion as a clinician. And um, I have this extraordinary privilege of being able to train really now thousands of other mental health providers. Um, before COVID, I also had the great, great privilege of really being able to travel around the world to train mental health providers. And I finally said, after about a year, I finally said to my husband, I'm actually missing being in an airport. It took a year. <laughs> but give, it, give it one airport trip <laughs> and we'll revisit that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to being able to do that again. You know, everything that I'm doing now, as is the case for, I think the majority of mental health providers is in fact online. So teletherapy for individual therapy sessions and all of our trainings are now online. Um, and, you know, thank God that's actually been a fairly seamless transition, but energetically, there's nothing like face to face. And so I'm greatly looking forward to being able to return to that reality. Yeah. One of the things I failed to mention in the introduction is I'm also a student. Um, one of the great gifts that Lisa gave me as uh, the rabbi of this community, of this shul, um, was she invited me to uh, audit, I guess, a, uh, a course, uh, the, the beginner's course on how to be a trauma-informed therapist. Um, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a mental health professional by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it was just such an incredible experience to be uh, with 65 uh, wonderful women uh, Lisa's son, who was also um, auditing the course, um, and myself. Um, and it, it was amazing. I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the difference between trauma-informed therapy and other styles of therapy. What makes trauma-informed therapy different? Yeah. And what I also want to say is that although you're not formally trained as a mental health provider, I would absolutely describe you as a trauma-informed rabbi. Uh, and I think that's hugely important. So when we're trauma informed, it means that we're able to look at people through this very specific lens where a lot of behaviors that normally wouldn't make sense do make sense because we're able to frame them or reframe them as coping strategies and survival strategies. And when you can approach people and look at them through this trauma informed lens, the difference is that you're able to hold a tremendous amount of empathy and compassion and you're far less likely to be judgmental. You're far less likely to get frustrated, frankly, by some of the coping strategies and survival strategies that trauma survivors inevitably you know, have to use in order to navigate growing up in, in, in really adverse conditions. You mentioned a little bit that you had worked with victims of clergy abuse. Um, anyone who's spent a considerable amount of time on Netflix over these last 11 months, at some point, we'll talk about that later, um, at some point comes across the movie Spotlight. Um, you know the movie Spotlight about the, the Boston Globe, I think, um, their work on clergy abuse. Um, could you talk about um, a little bit your work in that and um, what that was like and, and what's supporting uh, those clients, uh, what that work looks like? Yeah, and not only was is Spotlight one great, one tragically great example, um, but many other people may also be familiar with the documentary called The Keepers. And um, in that documentary, it's the story of a priest in Baltimore who abused hundreds of girls. And I've actually had the privilege of being the therapist for several of his survivors. Um, so I've worked with folks who've been abused by priests, who've been abused by rabbis. It's, you know, being abused by any trusting adult is horrific and the sense of betrayal is profound. I'm gonna say that there's a, an additional kind of unique experience that I think survivors of clergy abuse 
feel, and that is not only do they feel betrayed by their perpetrator, they also feel betrayed by God. And it can profoundly impact their faith, their spirituality, their, their religious observance. Tragically, I've worked with a number of, of survivors over the years where their perpetrator actually wove into the sexual abuse religious ritual and religious liturgy. So there's this terrible tainting of things that normally would bring somebody comfort, give them a sense of identity, help them to feel grounded and safe, give them a sense of communal connectedness. And they get robbed you know, of, of those rituals when something horrific like sexual trauma has been woven into it uh, in order to just justify, I'll put that in air quotes, injuring and, and harming and assaulting a child or a teenager. So it's profound and the reverberating impact is, um, it takes years and years and years. And again, as you mentioned in the beginning, I do approach every single client with tremendous optimism and hope. And I believe that because if you're sitting across from me in a therapy session, I know you've already survived the hardest thing. You've already survived living you know, through that trauma as a child without resources, without, you know, full cognitive development yet, with, without often any support whatsoever. And so if you've been able to navigate and survive that, that enables me to hold a tremendous sense of hope. And I often say to my clients, only one of us needs hope. I've got it. You could borrow mine and we'll help you access the part of yourself that, that can reclaim that sense of hope as well but it, it really is a profound kind of betrayal. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanna, for full disclosure, um, I wanna mention that one of the things that I learned from you, Lisa, um, is the idea of parts. It, it sounds so simple when you say it, but when you actually think about it, um, it's really helped me in my relationship with you talk about, uh, talk to you as a rabbi, talk to you as a human being. Sometimes those don't go together. Um, talk to you as a parent, right? We've, we've chatted about yeah. how difficult parenting is. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit because you mentioned early on, you talk about resilience. Um, so we're now, uh, we've now reached uh, what I experienced, and I think in speaking to many, many others, um, we've reached a, a, a brick wall. We've hit a brick wall in this pandemic experience. Um, and, and it's been difficult to try and figure out what that really is all about. What, what brick wall am I talking about? Um, but in the last two weeks, almost every conversation I'm involved with, um, every connection I try every time I reach out to people, people are expressing to me that this is now hard, right? This is now feels very difficult where we, we are reaching a landmark of Purim, um, which, um, you know, I'm thinking about today, finding joy on Purim on, in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and I, so I, I think there's a real message about resilience um, and how resilience and joy kind of go together, um, possibly. Um, so I, I want to challenge you or, or ask you to talk about how do we find resilience after doing this for a year? Um, what should that be? What should that, what should that look like? Is there, and the, the second piece to that is, is there an element of trauma through this experience that each of us are having? Um, and what does that look like? So I'll start with that first. And I think the answer is absolutely yes. I think, of course, like everything else, it operates on a continuum. I think there are people who have been profoundly traumatized and really have full-blown PTSD you know, a year into this. And then I think there are people who are frustrated, uh, bored, angry. I think that wall that you're alluding to relates to a feeling of relentlessness. You know, it's very interesting when you have traumatic experience that's not you know, um, a self-contained single episode, but in fact has this longitudinal dynamic to it. In the earliest stages of that kind of experience, we actually experience something called the honeymoon phase. And if you think back, try to think back a year ago, you know, last March, I know it's hard, but <laughs> uh, I, I, I found this really extraordinary. Almost the tagline to almost every commercial on television regardless of what the commercial was for, the tagline was, we're in this together, and we're going to get through this together. And so in the earliest stages of something that 
is clearly going to last more than a day or two. There is this energy that happens for most of us as human beings. And we kind of come together and we rally together and we see it as an opportunity for support, uh, to encourage each other. The problem is, is that you can't sustain that, you know, you do reach that place. And I think for different people, that kicks in at different times. I have clients who the Hollywood, the, that honeymoon phase, you know, disappeared in week three. And I have clients who, like you said, two or three weeks ago, that honeymoon phase was behind them. And that feeling of, I don't want to say despair, but I think it's, again, it's the relentlessness of it. It's feeling like, where is the light at the end of the tunnel? And I think what's in some way exacerbated that now is kind of where we're holding with the vaccines. So on the one hand, you know, thank God, right? The vaccines, it's extraordinary, done in record time. Millions of people, you know, are getting it and will get it. But we all know, depending upon where you live, I don't know how, how variable this is, but certainly in Baltimore and in other places, it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't gone that smoothly. You know, and I'm being kind here, right? Very disorganized. Um, a lot of people don't even know how to go about signing up to, to register to get the vaccine. I think that's exacerbated the frustration and the relentlessness and that little bit, that little edge of despair that people are, are feeling. So there's a real duality. You know, if you look objectively at the numbers, and I'm very fortunate to be married to a physician who plays, pays very close attention to all of this. And he's been able to give me a real sense of hope, frankly, because, you know, he shows me the graphs and they keep going down the numbers and the hospitalizations go down and thank God the deaths go down. And, you know, we need to really look at that and, and hold that and, and derive some sense of encouragement from that. But again, this whole issue with the vaccines and, you know, for, I also work with a lot of parents where their children's education has been a mess and, you know, they keep vacillating between virtual and going back live. And so we, we all know this has impacted us on, in many ways on many levels. In terms of the resilience, we know that resi we're resilient because frankly, we're still standing. So even though we're discouraged, even though we're angry, even though we're frustrated, you know, even though we don't always wake up and hop out of bed with a lot of optimism or enthusiasm, I, I do think that if you can grab back onto what for me has been the antidote to all of this, which is gratitude you can hold on to some semblance of gratitude. You know, thank God I'm, I'm here. If you're healthy, <laughs> thank God you're healthy. If you've been able to continue working in some capacity, whether it's, you know, through Zoom meetings or however it is that you've been able to do it, um, holding, just noticing what you still have to be grateful for. And I'm, I don't wanna be Pollyanna-ish about this because People have really, really suffered, and there has been profound and tragic loss, not just around illness and death, but the, with unemployment. We In the mental health field, we are seeing dramatic upticks in depression, in anxiety, in relapsing, substance abuse relapsing. We're seeing increases in domestic violence. We're seeing increases in child abuse. We know that there are tons and tons of children who are not getting enough to eat because the predominant way in which they get fed is at school. And so if they're not in school, many of them are not getting breakfast and lunch. So I, I don't wanna sugarcoat this. This has been an extraordinarily traumatic experience for all of us. My belief, and you and I have talked about this in more than one capacity, Rav, my belief is that there's so many things in life that are out of our control and we've talked about as observant Jews, you know, spiritually and philosophically and religiously, most people hold to the idea that really nothing is in our control, right? Everything is in Hashem's hands. I, I think we got faced with the reality of that, that, that loss of control, that lack of control in this past year in such a profound and again, relentless kind of way. But having said that, I still believe that we, that Hashem has given us the ability to choose. And every day we have countless moments. I call them crossroad moments. So something comes up and in that moment, you have choice. You have choice behaviorally, you have choice emotionally, you have choice about the extent to which you take care of yourself or don't take care of yourself. And so I think again, the counterbalance, all of which feels so out of our control 
is to really keep our focus on the choices, the small cho choices, and sometimes they're big choices, that, that we are able to make every single day. Holding on to some semblance of agency, holding on to some feeling of gratitude, uh, these are the things that ultimately I think are going to get us through. And I think reminding ourselves that we, we're wired to survive. Hashem gave us that. It's literally in our DNA. We're wired to survive. And so every day that you wake up and you're here, if you like, you can frame that as a moment of resilience. You can frame that as a moment of gratitude. And having that awareness that you're here, thank God you're here another day, you woke up, you're still here. Now, what are the choices that I can make for myself, for my children, for loved ones, for my community? What are the choices that I can still make that are still in my power that will give me a sense of meaning? And if it's okay, I, I want to talk about meaning for a second because, Please. because my belief as a trauma therapist is that at the end of the day, it's not the trauma itself that impacts us the most. It's the meaning that we bring to the trauma that has the long standing impact emotionally, cognitively in terms of our thought process, behaviorally, and even somatically on our bodies, because we know, you know, because you took the program, trauma lives on our bodies. And it can profoundly impact our physical well being as well as our mental well being. So this huge thing is happening that is not in our control. One of the things I believe that is in our control is the meaning making that we bring to this experience. And boy, is that a crossroad moment, right? Because you, I've got clients who, you know, have a history of trauma. And I, I think it's important to point out that if you come into COVID with a pre-existing condition of a lot of trauma in your background, that this is triply challenging and difficult because it's not, it's, it's not a big leap to take this year, to take this experience and say, see, here's more evidence that the world is an unsafe place, that terrible things keep happening, that I'm trapped, that I'm powerless. So I think for people who have that history, you know, they can very easily kind of land in, in that kind of meaning making. And as a therapist, frankly, I have to work pretty proactively to, to help expand my clients' narratives about what this year means. Because you can also look at this as a year where Hashem has invited us to slow down, to reevaluate our priorities, to reconnect with our family and our children and friends. I'm doing more Zoom you know, meetings with friends than I've ever done in a lifetime. And frankly, it, it's wonderful you know, to, to make those connections. It is an opportunity to, to feel a deeper sense of gratitude. It is a, an opportunity to make a difference and, and a contribution in your community to, to help other people. So the meaning making is ultimately where our power lives. And that's going to add to our resilience. If we can bring meaning making that's hopeful, that's optimistic, that holds gratitude and, and recognize that there are things to gain from this experience. I, I want to, uh, I want to dig into two things. I also want to mention that there's been a request for you to speak up a little bit uh, sure. where possible. I can even do um, yep. this. You, um, you mentioned that trauma lives on our body. Um, one of the things that stands out in my mind um, from the class that I took with you uh, is that trauma doesn't live in the language center in our brains. Um, and therefore, it's very difficult for trauma from, from victims of trauma to talk about their trauma um, because words don't necessarily bring the healing that um, that is needed or that is sought. Um, can you explain what that means and what does that look like? Yeah, um, well, let's back up. We know that trauma actually is not stored in the language in the part of the brain. It's stored viscerally meaning on the body and it's stored visually. And that's why so many trauma survivors often go into flashback as a beginning way to reconnect with past traumatic experience. Often it's because the trauma has occurred at such a young age that the victim is pre-verbal and literally does not have a vocabulary, does not have words to describe, you know, what they're experiencing and, and what they've endured. So we know that it goes to the body and, it, and it, it's visual. There are sort of pictures and images. And this can be very fragmented. 
it's not necessarily linear at all, right? But sort of snapshots, you know, individual, again, fragmentary images that people hold about their experience. So you're absolutely right to suggest, and this is good because it brings us full circle to a question you asked in the beginning about trauma informed. I'm gonna add to that definition now that being a trauma informed therapist means you don't simply just do talk therapy. Once you understand that trauma doesn't really live in the languaging part of the brain, and I'm gonna add another reason why, and that is because so many perpetrators threaten their abuser, right? If you tell anybody what I'm doing, I will harm you, I will harm your pet, I will harm your sibling. And so there's perpetrator threat that often lives in, in a victim's head, like throughout their lifetime. And so that becomes another reason why they're, they're, they're terrified, frankly, of using words to describe their past experiences. So trauma-informed therapists understand that and know that what that means is that you have to be able to bring into the therapy work what we call right brain-based and expressive modalities. So it's not 50 minutes of just talking. It's bringing in art techniques. It's bringing in movement so that we can help our clients access sensation on the body. It's working with sand tray. It's working with music, right? So trauma-informed therapists in 2021 know full well. And just for your, for your listening audience, if you are looking for a trauma-informed therapist, one of the easiest ways that you can assess for that is to ask the potential therapist the kind of treatment modalities that they use. And if they don't offer you anything more than talk therapy, in my book, that's not really a trauma-informed clinician. So they have to have some experience, some expertise, bringing in those more expressive, creative modalities. My belief is that so many trauma survivors show us their pain narratives rather than talking about their pain narratives. And they may show that pain narrative through self-mutilation, through eating disorder behavior, through an addiction. And so again, looking at that through a trauma-informed lens, you understand that you're not just talking about substances, you're talking about using substances as a way to self-medicate, as a way to numb emotion and memory that may have its roots in a prior, you know, very traumatic experience. What does that look like in the context of, I mean, thank God, hopefully um, none of us are experiencing that level of trauma from this experience, but what does that look like in the context of this pandemic? Like how, how do I feel or understand the trauma that I'm experiencing being isolated for 11 months where, which we know there are some people who really just haven't left the house since yeah. last Purim. Yeah. So I think it's important to understand that trauma can show up uh, behaviorally, right? So really inviting people to have a level of self-awareness about their eating habits, their sleeping habits, whether or not they're moving and exercising their bodies. Um, the behavioral choices that they're making throughout the day, are they engaging in acts of self-care? I'll tell you now as a therapist, it's one of the predominant things that I'm focusing on with my clients is making sure in a very intentional way that they are consciously engaging in acts of self-care as a counterbalance to some of the trauma that they're experiencing around COVID. So we look for the emotional fallout and that might be depression or anxiety. We look for the behavioral manifestation. We look for what's happening on the body. My husband is a family physician and we talk a lot about how you know, he's seeing a lot more patients showing up in the office with GI upset and migraines and you know physical pain, physical manifestations from some of the PTSD, some of the fallout from COVID. So you know, we wanna look at all of those arenas. We wanna look at our thought process so if you're noticing that you become more pessimistic, if you're noticing that in this conversation we're having tonight, and I mentioned gratitude, and you're listening and you're thinking, I have nothing to be grateful for. You know, that's a manifestation of perhaps some depressed mood, which could well be a byproduct of, of COVID. You know, you talk about the, the distancing and the isolation. I think this is a really key point because unfortunately, one of the ways in which we've all been told we must ma manage and navigate this pandemic is through what's being described as social distancing. And I think it's really important to reframe that as 
physical distancing. So yep, you gotta wear your mask and you have to keep six feet apart. But I don't want people to operate from that mindset of social distancing, because that's the mindset that creates really profound isolation. And that isolation absolutely leads to depression and anxiety and despair, and will greatly increase somebody's vulnerability towards turning to drugs, alcohol, food. Um, we should add the internet. We should add 10 hours of Netflix every day, you know, gambling online, uh, porn addiction, you know, this, it's not just food and alcohol anymore. So um, we want to still find ways to feel socially connected, even though we understand that we have to physically maintain you know, six feet of distance. So making sure that in whatever way is manageable, you're still reaching out, whether it's on the telephone, whether it's through Zoom, whether it's via email. I've got a couple of clients who told me that they started writing letters, a lost art, right? <laughs> started reaching out to friends, to extended family, writing letters, you know, getting letters back and kind of loving that. So that's a form of social connection that we really want to make sure we're finding ways to sustain. I don't remember what happened to it, but at some point early on in this, uh, this whole experience, we had discussed in the show doing, uh, creating a pen pal, but like a letter pen pal, specifically for the kids, but maybe we should have done it for the adults as well. Um, as much as the kids do. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Can you, can you talk about I guess share, if you're comfortable, share some of your greatest joys or some of your greatest success stories or um, some of the most profound moments uh, being a therapist for a couple of years. Yeah, you're make, you, see, you see the smile you've brought to my face. Honestly, it, I can't, there aren't really words to describe the extraordinary privilege that it is to sit with a person whose pain is so palpable, whose suffering is so real, and to watch them summon every day, every session, courage and bravery and to not give up and, and to move through the therapy process and frankly, to reclaim themselves, to reclaim their lives, to discover at the end of all of this that there's so much more than what happened to them. And one of the more profound shifts you know, that I always listen for and frankly try to move along to the extent that I can is when, it, when a client is able to shift from I am bad to something bad happened to me. Because so many trauma survivors, you know, we haven't used the word shame yet tonight, but so many trauma survivors go through life with profound and deep feelings of shame and self-blame and self-loathing. And so one of the hallmark features of my work as a clinician is to keep infusing every single session with self-compassion, to really point out to my clients when they talk to themselves in ways that are critical and judgmental and shaming and negative, and to really pause the work and kind of rewind the tape and say, is there a kind of way you could say that to yourself? And if they can't come up with a kind of way, uh, I'll go to a resource in their life. Well, how would your grandma say that? How would your rabbi say that? How would, you know, how would your partner say it? How would I say it? Because I get an eye roll, but I get a, react, I get a response. When I ask them. <laughs> so to watch people be able to transcend what's been done to them and to really genuinely feel and believe that they're no longer defined by what happened to them. And then to help them get to a place that we call post-traumatic growth. So most people, you know, most people know about PTSD. That's a, you know, fairly well-known concept, post-traumatic stress disorder, but not everybody knows about post-traumatic growth. And that's when the client is really able to attach newfound meaning to their past experiences, and then actually uses what's happened to them as a source of inspiration to pay it forward and to help other people in their lives. And I've, I mean, in the course of my career, I've watched people go to schools to, to talk to kids about, you know, how they can be safe in their bodies. I have clients who volunteer on hotlines. I have clients who've written books. I have clients who, you know, have done extraordinary things, really paying it forward and being an amazing source of inspiration. And there's nothing more gratifying than, you know, just being able to witness that journey. It, it strikes me, um, and perhaps this is obvious, um, but it strikes me the idea of being able to pay it forward 
um, replaces the original meaning for for the client, for the trauma victim, and gives a new meaning, um, yeah. which I I would venture to guess. Right, I'm not the expert here, but I'd venture to guess that's part of the healing process. Yeah. Um, connecting yeah. new meaning to the experience. Exactly. Um, I'm debating a little bit whether to ask you about one specific story that you shared with me um, about a client, but I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna ask you about a specific client. I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit more about shame because uh, number one, we don't have so much time. And uh, one of the things that stunned me in our, as I recall uh, in one of our conversations at some point is I think you shared with me that shame is an introduced value, that we're not born with shame. That is absolutely my belief. Um, and, and you know that right now I'm in New York uh, having the absolute, when you asked me for something joyful, I was gonna tell you about my seven month old grandson. You became a grandparent in a pandemic. <laughs> the brightest of bright lights, right? Talk Thank about God. Grateful for, right? Right. Um, yeah, so that, that's been very extraordinary. And so when you look at a very, very small child, and again, we, we've had this experience, you know, over Shabbos, and we're still here, which is amazing. This little being basically thinks that he's the center of the universe, right? He might be. He might be. In our family, he is. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, I believe that every child who comes into the world comes into the world frankly, loving who they are, you know, a creation from Hashem. And, and I think the reaction that a child gets from the people in the world whom they trust and love is either a reaction that's going to support the notion of worthiness, being lovable, being valued and of value, or a, a small child is going to begin to get reactions from caretakers who are abusive, dysfunctional, toxic, who have their own unresolved trauma, that child is gonna to begin to get responses that are shaming, that are ridiculing, that are judgmental, where the child is ignored or the child is made fun of in some way, that becomes the seed of shame. And frankly, the difference between guilt and shame, you know, we can feel upset about something that we've done if we feel like we've hurt someone or, you know, um, and we have regret about that, but shame, goes to the core of who you are. And so a person who holds a sense of shame feels fundamentally damaged and flawed and worthless. And these are adjectives that I hear every day, you know, in my practice. I am broken, I am damaged, I am flawed. And my belief, and this is the hope that I bring to the work as a clinician, again, is that that's not, that's not their core sense of self that that was a learned narrative in response to you know, what they were not given, not having gotten the secure attachment that every baby needs and deserves in order to thrive. And so the beautiful thing about being a trauma therapist is that I'm not, it, this is not about people reinventing themselves. This is about people reclaiming themselves. And what they're, I believe that they're reclaiming is this core feeling of of lovability and, and being incredibly worthy and being good enough. So one of the manifestations of shame as a client moves through life, and I, I, I know unfortunately that many listeners are going to relate to this because to varying degrees, this is kind of a universal condition, um, is not feeling good enough. And so, you know, again, part of my work is helping clients connect with the idea that you've always been good enough. I, yeah. I, I remember why that sticks out in my mind in one of our many conversations, because to me, it added so much commentary and color to the Adam and Eve, to the Adam and Chava story, um, right? Remember, I, I think I shared that with you. What if one of the versions of that story is a, is a story about shame? Um, and it explains so much about their rea reaction to their mistake and why all of a sudden they feel naked, right? They, they recognize their nakedness and they clothe themselves. And when God approaches Adam and says, what's up? Adam says, ah, you know, um, what if that's the first moment in history where shame is, in, is introduced? Um, and the critical question that's asked there is what happens with it? What happens next? Um, 
I remember thinking about this within the context of a number of, of stories with Noah, with, with Avram, with Moshe a little bit. Um, I, we, we only have like two or three minutes left. Um, so I wanna ask you one uh, broad question. Um, what do you hope will be true about the world in the future, um, post pandemic? That's um, a question, Rabbi. <laughs> You know, in two minutes or less, <laughs> what do you hope to see? Uh, what, what do you hope will be true about uh, connections between people, about how we turn up uh, into whatever space we're turning up in? Um, you know, what, what do you hope will be true that, please God, we're gonna get to that place where COVID is part of history um, and we will, um, you know, everyone's kind of say, when, you know, when do we return to, to normal? Um, but I wonder, you know, what do we want for the, the future of our world? Yeah. You know, for me, I like to approach life with this core belief that anything and everything has the potential to be a teachable moment. So I don't use words like failure. Uh, I think it's all, there's always the potential for teachable moments. I think this is, you know, a very sustained teachable moment, you know. We get the message. We get the lesson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hope we get the message because I can tell you this about human nature. You know, when we're faced with something that's really fundamentally life-changing, and I've seen this countless times in, in my career as a therapist, we have this limited newfound appreciation, right? This newfound feeling of gratitude and, um, you know, we sort of see the world in a different way and, um, and then it doesn't last, right? And I, I think that's important. I, I mean, I don't know why, it's human nature, but maybe, maybe, maybe because this has been such a sustained experience for all of us, maybe there is an opportunity this time around because every one of us has been impacted, again, on so many different levels. Maybe the lingering positive impact of gratitude, of reprioritizing, you know, of letting go, of not sweating the small stuff, of really holding on to with genuine appreciation for like what matters in life, in our relationships. Maybe, 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 and this is my hope, that we sustain, you know, those, those feelings, those, those experiences. And, and maybe it's commensurate, you know, maybe you have to have a year pandemic to be able to sustain, you know, that degree of um, of gratitude, you know, there have been some remarkable, beautiful stories. You know uh, what what people have done in their communities, you know, to help the elderly, to help each other. Really remarkable, amazing stuff. And my hope is that we continue to find ways to sustain that because there's extraordinary goodness in humankind, extraordinary goodness and kindness. Lisa, there's a woman in our shul who's been going to shul since she was three years old. She's now in her mid eighties. Uh, she's a wonderful, the most grateful human being in the world I've ever met. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. Um, and when we closed shul, um, the anniversary of our closing shul was the Shabbos after Purim. Uh, so this coming Shabbos is gonna feel significant. Um, when we closed shul and that really, I believe her was the first Shabbos in 80, 80 odd years of her not going to shul, um, I expected to get on the phone with her and hear anger, hear resentment. I, I you know, I, I, I mean, we were all in such a weird place. Um, and I got on the phone with her and she expressed such gratitude, um, such optimism. And um, I made the commitment to call her every Friday uh, because I needed to find that person who could share that with me. Um, and it, it paid off because she started making me chopped liver and, uh, uh, and uh, chocolate pie. Uh, so thank God, I am extraordinarily grateful for those phone calls. Um, I, I will also mention one other thing. Lisa, I'll mention one other thing. I was listening to a podcast with Brene Brown and uh, John Gutman, um, the like world renowned marriage therapist. Um, and he was talking about the idea of a gratitude diary. Um, yeah. on a regular basis, as often as you can, whether daily, weekly, uh, to write down three things that you are grateful for. Um, and when you look back at that diary, you know, a month, two months, three months later, even if you're stretching, right? Like 
Today was a miserable day. My kids were screaming, the children burnt. We were outside in 22 degree weather. Like even if it was the very most challenging of, Shab this is all theoretical, the most challenging of Shabbatot, um, you know, that chopped liver, I'm going to, I'm going to be so grateful for that chopped liver. And I'm going to be grateful for this conversation, Lisa, as always, every time we get to speak um, is, is wonderful. Thank you so, so much. I want to give you one last word before Rabbi Pardo jumps in. So I'm going to just, I'm just going to corroborate what you said. There's actually a lot of research to substantiate the idea that if you, for 30 days, for, for one month, three things you're grateful for, and don't repeat so there's the challenge. <laughs> Let's leave everybody with this, with this inv I like to call it an invitation. So the invitation is for 30 days each day, and doesn't matter when throughout the day, but by the end of the day, you write down three small things that you're grateful for and you don't repeat. It literally changes your brain chemistry. Gratitude changes brain chemistry in positive ways. So that's a great project. And 30 days from now is a week before Pesach. And we are going to need a lot of gratitude a week before Pesach. <laughs> Rabbi Pardo. And I just want, I mean, it could be, uh, people don't know this, it could be like small, silly things. It doesn't have to be, I'm thankful for the my family and the laws of physics. It could be like, I'm thankful for whipped cream and, you know, non-fat, whatever. There's nothing Zero. small about whipped cream. I was just going to say, whipped cream would definitely be on my list. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking of cheese in a can. I realize it's not like actually a thing. Uh, Seen in the past number of decades. Anyway, um, I just want to say that um, anyone who came late, I highly recommend you go back and watch the whole thing. This has been um, an incredible treat, um, such a such a, a, a rich conversation, um, and it gained so much just listening in. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi Schaffer, thank you, Lisa, um, and um, uh, any any um, besides that little piece of homework assignment. Um, gratitude journal for the next 30 days, a certain way of uh, social media code machag preparing for the holiday. Um, Lisa, if, if we want to learn from you or, or, or you know, follow up in some way, how can we, how can we find you? Oh, sure. The easiest way is probably my website, which is just theferrensinstitute.com. And there's lots of free resources there and my contact information is there, my books are there. Um, so theferrensinstitute.com is the easiest way. Okay, terrific, amazing. Um, to both of you, have a Freilichen, Freilichen Forum. Um, Thank you. The greatest. And uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Have a Shavuot. Lisa, travel safely. Thank you. See you soon. We'll see you back in Baltimore soon. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi Pardo. Bye-bye. Call to we are off next week. Just